It's almost 1 p.m. in Sydney, 11 a.m. in Singapore and Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Paul Allen. Here are the top stories. Asian stocks treading water as traders await the US CPI print for fresh clues on Fed policy. Hong Kong stocks giving up earlier gains ahead of earnings from tech giants Alibaba and Tencent. Japanese bond yields surging to decade-plus highs on bets the BOJ will further reduce debt buying to ease pressure on the ailing yen. Plus, Janet Yellen admitting China may retaliate against any tariff hikes from the Biden administration. We'll hear exclusively from the U.S. Treasury Secretary. All right, let's get straight to markets, though. Take a look at how they're faring. Averill Hong's in Singapore, keeping an eye on things. Averill. Yeah, Paul, we're seeing Asia stocks moving sideways. You get the feeling this is the way it's going to be until we get the US CPI print uh, that is projected to show moderation, but not enough to prompt Fed rate cuts. We did see Chinese equities starting the day on the front foot, but they've pulled off session highs, even ahead of those big tech earnings out of China. Uh, keeping an eye as well on what we're seeing on Asia FX, the threat of tariffs on China, along with potentially higher inflation, not a good mix for Asian currencies. In Japanese bonds, the sell-off from yesterday continues. Uh, we had the BOJ reducing its purchases in the 5 to 10-year zone. Our strategists say it won't be surprising if it starts doing the same in the 3 to 5-year zone. On the yield on the 2-year, it's hitting the highest since 2009. On the 10-year, since 2012. Off of the ball, let's take a closer look at what we're seeing in Chinese tech. Tencent Music beat on earnings. Uh, that's explaining some of the surge, but that optimism as well on what we're seeing uh, potentially on their earnings scorecard from Tencent and Alibaba to help justify these lofty valuations. Uh, flip the board again. Let's take a look at how Tencent's stock price has been faring since the January bottom. Despite that rebound, we're actually seeing the consensus price target that hasn't budged much. I think it's actually lower than what we saw in January. So reflecting a bit of the analyst caution towards some of these Chinese tech stocks, Paul. All right. Thanks, Avril. Uh, for more on those big China tech earnings, let's uh, bring in Bloomberg's Asia Equities reporter, Charlotte Yang. And uh, Charlotte, I just want to pick up on what Avril was pointing out there, particularly when it comes to Tencent. I mean, got some pretty lofty valuations there. Uh, revenue growth is expected to slow down. Uh, what are we expecting to hear today, particularly in terms of uh, share buyback? Yeah, so um, investors, or all their eyes are on you know, two of China's most um, expensive uh, value tech companies, Tencent and Alibaba. And with Tencent, investors are closely watching uh, uh, whether there will be a signs of a turnaround in its gaming business. Remember that earlier in April, it was this early and expected gaming blockbuster that really boosted its share price. And another thing that investors are closely watching is whether it's about Tencent's commitment to shareholder returns. So our data analysis showed that Tencent has accelerated its stock buyback in the first quarter, where since mid-January, we're saying they have, real, uh, re, they have lifted their daily repurchase of share buybacks to over one billion Hong Kong dollars. And the company earlier this year has said that they are going to commit to over 100 billion Hong Kong dollars of buybacks this year. And so far, they have bought about a quarter of that. But, but, with, but back then, you know, market was doing so bad. Tencent uh, is like below its intrinsic value. But now with all the rebound, investors want uh, up to 40 percent of share price uh, rebound since January, whether the company still committed to that pace of uh, stock buyback. Yeah, and that Tencent rebound, uh, same thing with Alibaba. It's part of a broader story, right? We've got the MSCI China up 27%, uh, I think, uh, year to date. Uh, how convincing is that rally, though? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think the street consensus is that China stocks is the worst is behind. But uh, our colleagues spoke to a number of big funds, including Pictic Asset Management, uh, Fidelity International. But the sense we got from them is that they still see the recent rally um, as a rotational play on valuations, where the China earnings they see hasn't yet um, delivered. And, with, and, and definitely the China tech companies is, uh, that's going to report later this week, including JD.com and Baidu will provide more um, 
uh, more uh, signs on that front. But in general, I think investors really need um, China earnings to uh, deliver to, to, to convince them that this is more of a structural story rather than just uh, technical opportunities. And so far for the um, constituents of the MSCI China that have reported as of yesterday, actually 30 percent, uh, actually 30 percent of them have shown Islam a net profit um, behind um, before exceptional items. So that's not an encouraging sign. And to many with a big powder that are still standing on the sidelines. All right, Bloomberg's Asia Equities reporter Charlotte Yang there. And uh, you can also turn to your Bloomberg for more on those China tech earnings. Go to TLiveGo, that's T-L-I-V-Go, and you can get commentary and analysis from Bloomberg's expert editors. And we're going to get more on uh, markets, uh, including China, right now with Rajiv Damello, Global Macro Portfolio Manager at GAMA Asset Management. Uh, Rajiv, thanks so much for joining us. I just want to pick up on uh, what uh, Charlotte was talking about there in terms of those tech earnings. Uh, we've seen Chinese tech stocks uh, putting in a pretty impressive rally, but is all the good news priced in at this point? And is the earnings story really that convincing, do you think? Well, thank you, Paul, for, for having me. I think it's part of a broader, a broader topic in terms of China's recovery. Um, and the measures which have been taken over the past six months now to turn around an economy which was slowing down at the end of last year, boosting it and supporting markets with, with purchases by the, the home team, the national team, uh, earlier this year in February. So getting those animal spirits back into the Chinese market is probably part of uh, the policymakers' uh, intentions. And they have a window to do this um, in terms of doing getting markets or the Chinese market stabilized in an upward trajectory before uh, the U.S. elections get too close and uh, the noise around protectionism and China bashing gets too strong. Yeah, well, we'll have a sense of how that plan is going. Uh, later on this week, we're going to get uh, industrial production, retail sales as well. Uh, the expectation is we'll see something of a modest rebound there. Uh, what are your expectations? Do you think some of these policies are working? Is the Chinese economy starting to turn a corner? Well, the Q1 data did show an improvement. We need to see confirmation for the second quarter. It's most likely that we'll see some weakening of a, a strong Q1. So I'm not too optimistic for the immediate batch of data. But what's more encouraging is the implementation of a series of policies which keep keep going on to support the market. And initially, that didn't have an impact on, on equity markets. Now it is having. Um, and I think it's critical for, for China to keep that going. And that includes you know, a lot of different types of fiscal and monetary and currency policies. Yeah, um, we've, we've seen an environment also of um, shrinking credit. Uh, loan growth has been disappointing as well. But even against that backdrop, uh, some of China's financial stocks have been performing very, very strongly, up about 8.7 percent this month. Uh, do you put that all down to the national team? Or what's going on here? How do you explain that? I think the national team contributed to the initial surge uh, in February and March. And then that was taken over by significant underweight positions being covered. But now I think there's expectations, and I expect rate cuts to come in. Um, we've, they've been pre-announced and signaled. I think they're imminent. It would make a lot of sense for China to ease on in monetary policy, support this, uh, this recovery, especially at this time uh, before the trade war with the U.S. Uh, goes to another level uh, early next year. Yeah, well, if the PBOC does ease, uh, does provide some rate cuts that's probably going to come at the expense of a weakening yuan. How do policymakers get the balance right? Yeah, that's always been their challenge. When one looks at the yuan, though, over the last 10 months, it's been broadly stable against the dollar. Our policymakers in China are very sensitive to any movements in the, in the yuan against the dollar because it sort of conveys confidence. But when one looks at the trade-weighted um, basket, which is really the official policy measure, looking at how is China's currency is evolving against a basket of its trading partners, well, the Chinese currency is not doing too badly at all. It's actually appreciated quite a bit. So I don't think they should worry too much about the, the, the currency. Uh, and even if it does weaken a bit, 
its, its volatility has been very low and it could, it could weaken without uh, really hurting confidence. So a rate cut, even if it does um, create a weakness in the currency, I don't think it's a bad thing for China. All right, uh, Rajiv Damello of the GAMA Asset Management is going to be sticking around. We'll uh, look ahead to the uh, upcoming U.S. CPI numbers a little bit later. But I uh, want to get some breaking news uh, across the terminal at the moment. Uh, we're hearing news that uh, Uber is planning to buy um, Hero's Food Panda Taiwan business, the price being $950 million. So that news uh, just crossing the Bloomberg terminal now, uh, Uber to buy Heroes, Delivery Heroes, a Food Panda Taiwan business for $950 million. Those are all the details we have on that uh, at the moment. Oh, well, the transaction is targeted to close in the first half of 2025. Uh, companies have also entered into an agreement for Uber to purchase $300 million in newly issued ordinary shares of Delivery Hero as well. So that news just crossing now, Uber to buy Delivery Heroes Food Panda Taiwan business for 950 million. Okay, still to come, we'll take a deep dive into India's markets uh, with Credence Family Office. They'll be joining us uh, to talk about the key risks to stocks and their preferred sector plays as well. That's coming up just ahead. Also, lesser known entrepreneurs are uh, joining the ranks of India's ultra wealthy. We'll tell you some more about these under the radar billionaires later this hour. This is Bloomberg. It shows the resilience of the American consumer. Rate structure may be higher, and we can talk about that, but the reality is it's in decent shape. There's a thousand things that can go wrong tomorrow, but right now everything's in pretty good shape. Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan there touting the strength of the U.S. consumer, and that's despite high interest rates. However, there are growing signs of pressure on household finances. A New York Fed survey says U.S. consumer expectations for inflation rose last month. Uh, prices are expected to jump at an annual rate of 3.3 percent over the next year. And that is the highest reading since November. That also mirrors recent findings from the University of Michigan showing year-ahead inflation expectations in early May at a six-month high. All right, Rajiv Damalo, Global Macro Portfolio Manager at GAMA Asset Management, still here with us. Um, he thinks the Fed's likely to cut rates in July. Uh, Rajiv, that's increasingly a, a lonely position, doesn't give the Fed much time to gather more data. Uh, what's your base case here? Well, inflation, um, there are many signs that inflation is moderating. And the Fed doesn't have too much time or too many meetings until the end of the year to actually get rates down. And real rates, that means the actual nominal rate that we all know, minus inflation, um, has been going up because inflation, even though it's sticky, has been coming down. So the Fed needs to send a signal somehow that it's starting a path of rate cuts. Um, and it probably can't do that in September, which might be better in terms of timing because of its proximity to the U.S. elections, which is highly contested and will be heating up. Uh, so it'll be very difficult for the Fed to move just the meeting before elections. And then it's got two meetings after that. So that's why you know, I continue to think that July uh, is a better time for the Fed to start easing. Um, that would suggest that inflation is going to come down a little bit. But uh, what are the risks that we're going to get an upside surprise this week? And what's keeping inflation so sticky in your view? Absolutely. I mean, we've had many upside surprises in the beginning of this year on inflation. Um, I think at every meeting, a lot of market participants expected inflation to come down only to be disappointed. And I think the Fed also was very disappointed. Um, and uh, that strength in inflation has been you know, pinned down to services, which has been higher. Inflation has been higher in the service sector. Unfortunately, a lot of signs also point that inflation is not coming down as fast um, as it could have. There are these second order effects which are there. Uh, wages remain high. Wage inflation has come down when we look at lots of measures of wage inflation and cost of employment, but hasn't declined that fast. Nevertheless, a rate at Fed funds where they are, it's still a huge gap above where inflation is. And of course, for the Fed, it's a credibility game, right? They, they want to show that they are fighting against inflation, but they also don't want to precipitate a recession. 
Well, obviously, investors would uh, love to see a rate cut, but if we're completely objective about this, looking at the U.S. economy, does it need the stimulus of a rate cut? Yes, the U.S. economy has been strong and it has been stronger than expected over the past few quarters. Yet there are signs that it's moderating somewhat. The challenge is that the softer data, the business surveys, show a bit of that moderation when one looks at ISM surveys or PMIs, you know, those types of business surveys, which typically tend to be, you know, a little bit earlier than the hard data. But they haven't yet, read, yet been confirmed by the harder real data, which tends to be a bit slower. But the Fed's job is not to look back at the past, but to be, to be ahead of the curve. And so if it's just seeing signs of a um, normalization growth, I'm not saying a, a recession or a slowdown, uh, it does, that does give it the room to actually start to ease policy, which is, which is very tight uh, by all, all measures uh, compared to the past. Well, of course, uh, one pronounced effect of uh, higher for longer rates has been a very strong U.S. dollar. Uh, how long do you see this enduring, and how is dollar strength informing your decisions? Yeah, the dollar, the dollar, as you mentioned, is, uh, has been helped by uh, these uh, higher for longer rates due to the stronger inflation in the U.S., but the U.S. growth has also been stronger, and it's all a relative story, so long as uh, Europe and China and Japan were kind of on the weakish side, that also gave an additional fundamental reason to be long dollars. However, they're catching up. We're seeing that Europe is posting some positive uh, GDP growth numbers after two quarters of negative at the last, la end of last year. So Europe's turning. China, we just talked about a bit earlier, is recovered in Q1. And even it might, though growth might moderate, it'll still be quite positive in Q2. And then uh, Japan actually is actively uh, intervening now to, 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 to resist uh, further strength of the dollar. So, uh, you know, dollar is probably coming to the, close to the end of its of its uh, strengthening cycle, but uh, it's, uh, it's a slow top, but it's a topping process. Yeah, just before we let you go, I'd like to get your views on Japan, particularly the yen. It's weakening again, 156.43 right now. Uh, how's the appetite for intervention in Japan right now? Well, they've done uh, maybe three or more rounds of, of intervention, significant amounts. Uh, of uh, dollars, have, they've sold dollars uh, to, to buy yen uh, at key levels very cleverly, taking advantage of mar market overextension in the first instance when we broke the 160, taking advantage of the uh, FOMC meeting as well, uh, slightly dovish tone by the FOMC, and, and uh, you know, Japan sold uh, more dollars. So Japan's done this intervention. Now it's a question of credibility. If it doesn't uh, slow the pace of depreciation of the yen, uh, then it'll be much more difficult for Japan to counter it. But at the same time, Japan knows very well, the policymakers know very well, that fundamentally it has to tighten policy to counter the weakening yen. And so I think that's the message they'll be sending. Uh, the next step, of course, is quantitative tightening in terms of after so much bond buying, reversing some of that. That would send signals to the market which are even more sure about uh, about yen, um, a yen strength than just uh, intervention. Yeah, and we are seeing uh, multi-year highs uh, and touching distance for a number of Japanese treasuries right now. But we've got to leave it there. Rajiv Damello of GAMA Asset Management, uh, thanks so much for your insights there. Still to come, Janet Yellen admits China may retaliate against the Biden administration's planned tariff increases. Our exclusive interview with the U.S. Treasury Secretary coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says China could always retaliate against any steps the U.S. takes to protect its critical new industries. Yellen declined to confirm Bloomberg reporting that the Biden administration is about to hike tariffs on Chinese goods, including electric vehicles. But she told us exclusively about the president's thinking on trade tensions. Um, he believes it's unacceptable as I do to be completely dependent on China in these areas. And um, he wants to make sure, given that China is really not 
uh, playing by the rules in the sense they have enormous subsidies uh, in critical areas of advanced manufacturing has resulted in overcapacity. He wants to make sure that um, the stimulus that's being provided through the Inflation Reduction Act to support these industries, and these are industries that are creating good manufacturing jobs in parts of the country um, that have been overlooked or have suffered from deindustrialization in the past. The president wants to make sure that he protects these investments. And I don't want to get ahead of the 301 review on tariffs, but this is a commitment that uh, President Biden has made, and I agree with it. I was in China just a couple of weeks ago and made clear that we would not allow Chinese overcapacity uh, to harm um, our emerging industries. Does the U.S. want a trade war, though, with China? We, we believe that we should have a deep and productive, and that we do in most areas, uh, trade and investment relationship. We're working to stabilize our economic relationship. Um, we do not wish to disengage from China economically, but we do think that the playing field should be fair. And uh, China engages in unfair practices like massive subsidies of industries they have decided um, are critical. And um, those are cases where we will act to protect ourselves. We've seen Beijing in the past, though, respond, and it's become tit for tat. Are you expecting a response? Could they go after Tesla or maybe American farm products? Well, um, President Biden believes that anything we do should be targeted to our concerns and not broad-based. And um, hopefully we will not see a significant Chinese response, but that's always a possibility. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen there speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Amory Hordern. All right, so let's take a look at how Apple suppliers are doing in China at the moment, because, of course, we did get the news that uh, Apple's going to start selling its Vision Pro outside of the U.S. for the first time. This is the headset that retails at uh, $3,500. But uh, Apple's been holding training sessions recently. It's been flying employees from its international stores to get training on how to demonstrate that device. So customers in Germany, France, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore and China could soon get their hands on the uh, Apple Vision Pro. So we've got Apple stocks or Apple suppliers rising at the moment. Also, uh, taking a look at shares of artificial intelligence related and game stocks in China as well. They've been advancing after OpenAI launched faster and cheaper AI model, that is GPT-4, also handles uh, other languages besides English. All right, uh, take a look at market movers as China heads to its lunch break. We've got more coming up in a moment. This is Bloomberg. Day on Sydney Harbour. Picked a good day to look at it. It's been raining for like two weeks solid here, so that's a very welcome sight. Uh, also welcome the news that uh, Jim Chalmers, the Australian Treasurer, probably going to be handing down his second budget surplus. That's happening a little bit later on this evening. And we got the Aussie dollar right now uh, just above 66 cents. As we await uh, that news, uh, the lockup has begun and that will uh, release in about six hours' time and we'll uh, know precisely what the contents of that budget is. And uh, one of the centrepieces in the budget is going to be a policy known as the Future Made in Australia. And that's got similar interventionist ambitions to the US Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, here's a little something I put together on it earlier. Australia's economic strength has been built on digging stuff up and shipping it out. It's an old idea which has paid off, and now another old idea is being revived, adding value to those raw materials first. This week in Canberra, billions in new spending will be thrown at green steel, critical minerals processing, solar panel manufacturing and other local industries. So what a future made in Australia is all about is not replacing private investment in the opportunities of the future, but attracting more of it. That will require some public investment and we need to make sure we get value for money for that. 
A future made in Australia is a flagship policy of the Albanese government as it eyes an election campaign likely next year. In many ways, it was born out of competitive necessity. The US has the Inflation Reduction Act. Japan has the Green Transformation Act. Canada and France are giving billions in tax credits to companies developing clean energy. Direct government intervention is having a moment worldwide, and Australia doesn't want to be left behind. An early recipient of a $260 million loan has been Alpha HPA, which produces high-purity alumina, oxides, nitrates and sulphates, critical minerals key to the energy transition. Australia has abundant critical mineral deposits, but limited manufacturing, with the global supply chain dominated by China. Skeptics warn reducing that dominance will require more than nationalist policies and cheap loans. I think it is critical for Australia to build its own, build a so-called alternative supply chains for critical minerals processing. But to replace or challenging China's dominance uh, is impossible because China's power is not just in the processing technologies, is the entire value chain, supply chains behind it. With extreme sadness that I confirm, Toyota will stop building cars in Australia. It's worth remembering it was only a decade ago the government subsidies for car manufacturing in Australia were pulled, causing Ford, GM and Toyota to shut down local production. Subsidies and tax breaks are now back for future-facing industries, at least for as long as the political climate encourages it. All right, for more on what to expect from tonight's budget, let's get to our economics reporter, Swati Pandey. And of course, um, Swati, a lot of stuff gets released in advance of budgets. Uh, we've already heard quite a bit about some of the future Made in Australia grants, but what don't we know? What secrets are being held back that we'll get tonight? Um, so we are still waiting to hear more about future Made in Australia. Um, how much money they are putting into it and how much will be allotted this year, if at all. Um, uh, one of the things that economists are still waiting to see is how much of the spending uh, is, is it going to be and whether it will be inflationary or not, whether it helps or hinders the RBA's inflation fight. The government has said that there will be some targeted cost of living relief. We already know there are some legislated tax cuts, but what these targeted relief measures are and how much of it will be inflationary, if at all. So I think there is a very uh, close eye on whether the spending is higher or not and whether it adds to inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about, uh, we saw some relief in the previous budget on energy prices. Could we anticipate anything there? Um, very unlikely. Uh, the government has not flagged and they are they have been talking about targeted measures however it will help the inflation fight if they do bring if, if they can do some sort of subsidy uh, there could be rental assistance though uh, which was already there uh, in the previous budget maybe they can extend it uh, in terms of energy they, there hasn't been uh, much and the government and both RB and government have said that it's um, likely temporary the spike that we are seeing so two surpluses in a row we're expecting and that's quite rare it hasn't happened too often in recent memory uh, but how enduring is it uh, what are the forward estimates going to say can are they going to keep going it's not enduring uh, so we are uh, expecting the government to forecast swinging back into red for next financial year and the following year as well uh, in fact the government has already flagged that the estimates are worse than the December forecasts so which actually means that the budget will be stimulatory in the forward years, even though in this financial year they are showing surplus, uh, they're probably spending more. And that's the question, where, where are they spending? All right, economics reporter Swati Pandey there, thank you. And uh, let's take a look now at some top geopolitical stories that we are following. A US trade group is pushing for higher levies on used Chinese cooking oil. Soybean crushes say a flood of used oil is weakening demand for U.S. crop-based ingredients used in renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. A group that represents the biggest U.S. soybean processors wants levies to be higher than the current 15.5% rate. Senior South Korean and Chinese diplomats have held their first face-to-face -face talks in Beijing in about six years. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi reportedly told his Korean counterpart, Sho Tae-yul, that both sides should oppose trade protectionism. A trilateral summit with Japan, that's expected to happen later this month in Seoul. 
The U.S. has ordered a Chinese crypto mining company off a property that it bought near a Wyoming Air Force base that houses nuclear missiles. The U.S. Committee on Foreign Investments says the proximity of Mine One Partners' operation to a strategic missile base is a significant national security risk. The company must now sell the real estate that it bought back in 2022. All right, plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. You're watching the India Focus, recapping some key data now. India's inflation rate, little changed in April. Food prices remained high, and that's complicating the outlook for interest rate cuts. CPI rose 4.83% from a year earlier. That was slightly lower than the previous month's reading. The RBI has kept its benchmark rate at 6.5% for more than a year now, and that's staying hawkish as inflation remains above target. Right, our next guest believes India's central bank uh, might not match the Fed cut for cut in the rate easing cycle. Uh, let's bring in uh, Chanchal Agrawal, CIO of Credence Family Office, a wealth advisor with more than a billion dollars in assets under administration. Uh, Chanchal, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I just want to start uh, with your outlook uh, for the RBI. What's the path ahead? Um, so outlook for the year, um, I think the markets, uh, you know, there is some uh, noise around uh, calling the markets frothy. Um, so there are two parts to the market, uh, you know, earnings multiple and uh, the earnings growth. Uh, multiples, I think there is no argument that the multiples uh, don't look cheap. But on the earnings growth side, I think there are a lot of levers which look positive, right? Um, so something like cement growth, power consumption, home sales, uh, etc. I think all these levers which uh, build up to the internal economy, me. Um, there is some sense of sense sense of strength around this. Um, obviously, there is a debate around uh, rural consumption not coming through and urban consumption still at pace. I think that that is more of a tailwind for us. Uh, coming ahead, we are hoping that uh, you know with with the whole uh, with the rural consumption coming up to pace, so we should see good uh, growth numbers coming to stem. Yeah, the infrastructure and growth narrative in India is a very strong one. But uh, when you're advising some of your wealthy clients, uh, how does the venture story look? How is the interest there? Uh, wealth clients, okay. So, uh, you know, the interest has been very divergent, uh, honestly. So, uh, after the whole inclusion in the you know, bond index, we expected a lot of uh, movement around the around the GSEC side of the curve, and which has really happened. Um, so, you've seen, uh, you know, 14, 14 and a half billion dollars coming in, which is uh, the first time after five years we've turned net positive on the uh, the bond market inclusion and the money coming into India, right? And 70% was there after, you know, we got included in the indexes. Uh, but strangely, through, we have seen a lot of interest coming on the private equity uh, side of the markets, be it late stage deals, be it pre-IPO deals, and that's particularly uh, the flavor of uh, a, a typical bull market. Um, so the question here is how long does it stay? But for now, I think there is just a lot of interest on, on the private equity and structured debt of, side of the market. Yeah, and in terms of uh, venture capital investing, uh, what sort of sectors are they looking at uh, outside of that infrastructure picture? Uh, how is the tech story looking? Um, so, uh, you know, venture capital typically started with fintechs. Uh, today, people are trying and investing into the new India. Um, so, you know, consumer tech, agri-tech, uh, defense is catching up uh, lots because of the whole, uh, you know, India defense theory. And recently, we've read this article where uh, Russia is now importing uh, defense articles from India. Um, so, I think from the whole uh, fintech side, people are now moving on to more innovative industry. Uh, consumption is taking uh, consumption and any consumer tech is uh, taking up a lot of space in, in the venture capitalist mind and largely because uh, the way India is structured, right? So if, if uh, there is a demographic dividend and if we have to grow at 8-10% for that matter, um, there will be still a lot of spends on the consumer discretionary versus, you know, typical FMCG products. So new innovative side on the consumption, uh, I think that is taking a lot of uh, consensus and focus from the venture capital investing. In terms of your own family office business, uh, are you finding that there's a lot more competition around these days and, and what sorts of new products are you developing? 
I think, um, I, like I mentioned last time, uh, the pie is only getting bigger, right? So, I mean, uh, if you if you just look at some parameters, and again, this is not the right way to look at it, uh, we're just 3% invested into equity markets, right? Uh, India as a whole pie is just 3% of the global uh, GDP, and in India, our focus is just 3 or 4% into the equity market, right? Now, assuming even if it just doubles and not really goes to 10, 15 odd percent, just doubles, uh, the market side is actually doubling in the next uh, uh, four to five years, right? So there's actually, the pie is very, very big. Uh, there is enough space for lots and lots of us to come in and make meaningful difference over here. Um, so competition, I think, uh, more than competition, uh, there is a lot of healthy competition that's uh, shaping up the industry. And you're having any trouble attracting talent? Uh, yes and no. Uh, of course, India is a talent base. Uh, so there is a lot of guys who are now uh, looking at innovative careers around uh, CFA, CE and all. So there are a lot of talent, a lot of uh, educational talent happening. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think some part of the talent also gets migrated to um, other countries, right? So that's that's a, the, that, that kind of is, is missed out from the crowd. But, uh, you know, there's just a lot of young, budding talent. Uh, and they're challenging the whole uh, tradition way of looking and doing things. I think that's more interesting and that's actually uh, you would need in a country like India which is now looking at more financial uh, independence and financial innovativeness if I have to say that. Of course there was a sizable and, and very wealthy uh, Indian diaspora around the world as well including here in Australia. Uh, do you have any strategies to capture some of that business? Um, so I think uh, Keep it simple as what our funda is. Uh, you know, a lo whole lot of people are looking at Indian markets uh, more from the purview of stable governments, uh, from stable equity markets and stable regulations and all. Uh, so I think uh, the the motto here is uh, keep it simple. Uh, the the market has a lot of uh, ideations around this. There are a lot of interesting ideas from the private equity side which are now getting listed, uh, which will in some sense broaden the whole horizon of market. I think. Uh, uh, betting on good managers, betting on good product ideations is what we strongly recommend uh, to all our set of investors. Uh, we seldom get into any, uh, you know, any, any structured fancy products. Uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple with a good manager. All right. And if, by keeping it simple, does that mean that uh, you're finding the regulatory environment quite easy to operate in? I'll say I'm finding it more stable, um, and uh, the budget, the last budget was the you know exact example of over it. Uh, a boring budget is the best budget because then there are no regulatory changes. In some sense, uh, uh, the minister, the finance minister, signaled that uh, we are stable, right? And that was a complaint that a lot of FIs uh, had on India, right? Uh, where there could be regulatory changes, uh, undefined regulatory changes. I think the motto around the budget was uh, we keep it stable, we are keeping it simple, and that was more. Like like a quote-unquote invitation um, to FIS to come and invest in India because uh, uh, things are going to look more and more uh, stable from, from your beat regulatory side, beat, beat on the currency side. I think that's a welcome change. All right, uh, Chanchal Agrawal, CIO of Credence Family Office, thanks so much for joining us. And of course, uh, markets in India have just opened. Let's see how we're tracking at the moment. We've got the Sensex in positive territory in the early going, uh, better by about a quarter of 1%. Uh, some of the other markets also pushing into positive territory. It's been a bit of a mixed picture around the Asia Pacific today, though. Uh, a lot of the other indexes in modestly negative territory, but uh, India bucking that trend. And uh, also sticking with India, it's now halfway through its seven stage national elections. Voting is now underway in Jammu and Kashmir, other constituencies as well. So, for more on this, let's get to our Bloomberg reporter, Advait Palepu in Mumbai. So, Advait, uh, how's voting? the turnout been so far and do we have a sense of uh, what it's saying about support for the BJP? Um, so as of last night at around 8 p.m., the voter turnout across 96 states, uh, 96 seats across 10 states and union territories was around 62 percent. Um, most analysts are looking at the voter turnout in the last four phases. The first four phases have gone to vote so far. And they've said it's a little lower than the 2019 polls, um, same figure in the 2019 polls. And they're saying that 
this could be attributed for many reasons. One is that um, there's a heat wave in India, record temperatures across the regions. So maybe voters aren't turning out in the numbers that were expected. But the other is that there is no one uh, consolidated theme around this election. There's not one singular message that's pushing voters out to the booths. So they are concerned that because there's a lack of one clear message from the ruling party, from the Narendra Modi-led government, that that could be a signal that maybe there is a less enthusiasm for the BJP this time around. Um, although that being said, uh, pollsters are pretty much split on, at this stage on whether that means the BJP will get the same seats that it did the, in, during the 2019 polls, whether they will reach the 400 mark, which is what the target of the Bharatiya Janta Party is, or whether they will um, miss the mark of uh, 300 seats, which is what their 2019 polls are. Yeah, well, of course, during Narendra Modi's term, India has been minting billionaires at a pretty brisk pace. Uh, besides some of these well-known names like Adani, there's a whole lot of names and entrepreneurs that we haven't heard of that are now in the ranks of the ultra-wealthy. Now, I know you've been looking into some of them and uh, what the billionaire class or the rise in the billionaire class says about government policy. What are you learning? Over the last decade, India has minted more billionaires than ever in its history. And this is... Uh, emblematic of sort of the government policies and the growth that we've seen in the country over the last decade. Uh, barring a few bumps in the road, uh, particularly the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, India's growth rate has been fairly strong. And because of uh, incredible amounts of spending on infrastructure, um, we've seen a number of uh, you know, infrastructure billionaires emerge, real estate billionaires emerge. You know, um, some of these billionaires uh, you know, Bloomberg's estimated their wealth uh, around the time uh, that the Modi government came into power was around billion dollars or less than a billion dollars. Today, they've crossed uh, six, seven, eight billion dollars. Um, some of these real estate moguls, you know, uh, would have had less than 10 million square feet of property under their belt. Uh, in 2014-15, today they're well above 40 to 50 million square feet. Uh, because of government spending across infrastructure, because of reforms in land acquisition, real estate, uh, we've seen uh, many of these billionaires leverage those policies and also benefit from these policies. So just as the Indian government's uh, spending on infrastructure, for instance, has gone from uh, about 1.6 trillion rupees in 2014 to about 11 trillion as of the last budget earlier this year. Uh, we've seen that that money sort of trickle down um, to large infrastructure players such as Larson and Tubro and the Adani Group, but also smaller infrastructure players that are today billion dollar that have billion dollar balance sheets. Uh, we've seen medium sized companies become large billion dollar companies. We've seen national players become international players, and similarly. We've seen this on the consumer side, just as the middle class has been booming. Um, per capita income in India has grown considerably over the last decade. Uh, the more consumption that's happening, we've seen a lot of companies, um, smaller companies that were perhaps not as well known uh, 10 years ago, now become household brands and household names across the country. Um, we've looked at five billionaires in particular who've um, really seen their wealth boom over the last uh, decade, who may have listed or not listed their companies on the stock exchanges uh, they tend to hold these kind of their companies uh, very tightly with large founder stakes uh, but there are tons of, dozens and dozens of Indian billionaires that are not as well known as some of the bigger names and we've just looked at five of them um, on Bloomberg this morning mm -hmm. all right so that's starting to change getting a bit of publicity now our reporter Advait Palepu there in Mumbai uh, let's uh, look at some of the other stories that we're following in India a media reports say 14 people have been killed and dozens injured after a billboard collapsed during a fierce storm in Mumbai. Rescue operations were ongoing. Authorities worried that about 20 to 30 people could still be trapped under the rubble. The tragedy, come, tragedy comes a week before the financial capital votes in the national elections. Bloomberg has learned that aluminium products maker Novalis is aiming to complete its planned US IPO as soon as next month. Novalis is owned by a unit of Hindelco Industries, controlled by Indian billionaire Kumar Nangalam Bila. Hindelco is said to be seeking to raise about $1.2 billion in the IPO and may target a valuation of about $18 billion. We have plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back. Here are some of the top corporate stories that we're following. Chinese property developer Agile has defaulted for the first time on publicly issued dollar bonds. The Guangdong-based company says it has not paid interest within a grace period that ended on May 13 on dollar bonds due next year. Agile says it will engage financial and legal advisors to evaluate its capital structure and liquidity. Anglo-American set to update investors on its plans for the business today, and this is after it rejected a second approach from BHP. BHP had sweetened its offer by almost 15%, valuing Anglo at $43 billion. Anglo, though, says the offer undervalues its business, while reiterating its rejection of the proposed deal structure. GameStop shares soared alongside other meme stocks as speculation swirled around a return to social media by Keith Gill, you might know him better as Roaring Kitty. A post on social media platform X showed a man leaning forward with what looked like a gaming controller. Some traders are interpreting that to mean the Gill is coming back into action. He shot to fame, of course, in 2021 by rallying day traders on Reddit in a bid to squeeze GameStop short sellers. OpenAI is launching a faster and cheaper version of the AI model that underpins its chatbot, ChatGPT. The company has debuted GPT-4.0, which it says is better at handling text, audio and images in real time. OpenAI says the updates will be available to users in the coming weeks. The startup is working to hold on to its lead in a market that's getting increasingly crowded. Okay, let's take a look at how we're tracking on markets at the moment. number of things we're watching, of course, we're going to get earnings. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, JGBs are kind of interesting, closing in on multi-year highs. Uh, the 40-year JGB yields uh, closing in on a number that we haven't seen since 2011. The yen continuing to weaken. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of earnings out today. We're going to hear from Alibaba, Tencent, Sony. Watching Tencent for a possible buyback. Sony might see its uh, revenue decline. Not a lot of new game titles out there for the PlayStation. And here's a look at what's moving on global markets at the moment. Broadly speaking, kind of a risk-off day around the Asia-Pacific. Uh, we do have the Sensex in India now just nudging into negative territory after a positive start.